Greg Meskel here with you, USA Water Polo at home, advanced. Thanks for joining us. For those that are joining us on Facebook Live, appreciate you joining us as well. This will also be available on demand on Facebook and on our USA Water Polo YouTube page. We have a great conversation today talking about bullying. This has been a time away from the sport of water polo. And so it's a chance to kind of refocus on some of those important things that make that team dynamic really special and successful. We have a great guest with us, uh, a true sport expert and author, Nadia Kaiba. And I want to get her book title correct called This is How We Roll, A Coach's Guide to Transforming Conflict into High Performance. Nadia, thanks for being here. Thanks for inviting me, Greg. It's so great to be here and be with your people. So much respect for your sport. Water polo has always seemed like just one of those crazy sports where I don't understand how <laughs> you guys are holding your breath for so long and swimming and throwing. And so thank you. I was just thrilled to be invited. Excellent. Yeah, we, we know we like to tout all of the difficult virtues of it, but also let everyone know that we would like them to try the sport. So it's that fun little oh. balance of being very challenging, but welcoming also. Okay, I, I wonder if that's a challenge for me. <laughs> it could it could be, it could be. Next time you're at the pool, if you want to cap up, throw throw the ball around, it could be a nice little entry in. Um, you know, and it's funny, as, as we were kind of talking about setting this up, and we've been sharing a lot of true sports articles and what you've been writing, uh, which has been, I think, really informative to our audience. And when we saw the topic of bullying, we've covered so much since the pandemic started, going back in all the way to March, and it felt like, we hit on maybe every topic you could want to talk about. And then I saw your article or a couple of them and thought that's something that'd be helpful. And so let's kind of dive into it, uh, pardon the water pun here, but everyone has their own kind of definition of bullying and they think it's one thing in your mind. You've, you've, you've obviously done some writing and research on this. How do you describe it? Oh my gosh, you, thank you for starting with that question because you sort of just nailed, um, hit the nail on the head by asking that question, because I think everybody does have a different definition of bullying. And what I've noticed in recent years, working with sports associations and even with um, businesses, the, the term bullying is sort of brandied about quite liberally. And it's sort of become a catch-all phrase that's being used to describe any negative behavior. And um, when I'm doing conflict management work with sports associations, I'm always really curious when they're talking about bullying what is the behavior that they're describing? Because we really need to get to the bottom of that. Um, when I'm thinking about bullying, it's, it's a very serious type of behavior. And the way I would describe it would be um, something that is going on for quite some time. And it would be systematic taunting or uh, physical or emotional abuse by someone who has power over another person. So that would be, you know, if I were describing bullying, I would, I would use that terminology. I generally try to use the, the terminology bullying type behaviors so that we're breaking it down into the specific behaviors. Because I think that when we just use the term bullying, we can be really watering down quite a serious topic. And um, I don't wanna do that. I wanna, I wanna treat it with the importance that it deserves. And that's really helpful, I think, to, to your point, to provide that kind of baseline understanding. So just to kind of build off what you were talking about, what are, what are some of those behaviors so people kind of have a sense of, of, of what they're talking about or what they're seeing maybe when you're talking about bullying type behaviors? Yeah, so it can, it can be a range of behaviors. Um, it can lead to, um, it, you know, if you're talking about a sports team, it can be exclusion of a, of a team member. There can be um, social media stuff these days that's going around. There could be pictures that are posted. There can be people, you know, um, locking people in a, in a change room. But the point being that it's, it's not a one-off thing. It's something that's systematic. Mm -hmm. And the other, the other significant part is that the person who, who is instigating the behavior or the group of people are, are people who have power over that other person. So if, if you're on a sports team and say it's, it's um, a clique on the team that are you know, more popular or they've been there for longer or they're older or somehow they have more power, um, they would be the ones who are, do, who are instigating that behavior. Now, for those that have read some of your work on True Sport or elsewhere, you, you talk about this kind of trauma-informed approach to kind of tackling bullying. What, what does that mean generally? Um, so a trauma-informed approach is a social work concept. So I'm a social worker. 
Um, and we use that approach to try and understand the reasons behind behavior. So rather than um, thinking of a person as a, from a deficit base where they're just, you know, somebody who, uh, who is focused on instigating this behavior, we look at well, why is it that that behavior is happening? We look at the person as a whole person um, who has perhaps experienced some sort of trauma in their life, whether that be in sport, whether that be in their home, um, at school, in some aspect of their life where they're trying to regain some power and that's why these behaviors are coming out. So um, just in terms of a trauma-informed approach, it, it, it's just a way of reframing your thinking um, when we're thinking about behaviors. So going back to that, not what is wrong with this person, but what has happened to this person. And, and why is that, you know, I mean, obviously, I'm sure this stuff evolves over time and there's been some different approaches for you and what, and what you've learned and experienced, why is that the best approach or an approach that you, that you like? Well, I, I like to think of coaches as being mini social workers or not even mini social workers, they are social workers. So the work that you are doing as a coach to bring a team together, whether that be in an individual sport or a team sport like water polo, um, you need to be thinking about the social dynamics that are happening on your team. And it, to build a strong team that's, um, that's, that's highly functioning, it's really important to be thinking about the dynamics, the problems and how they're being, being worked on on the team. So in thinking about a trauma-informed approach, you can think about that approach for every team member. So it doesn't have to necessarily be for somebody who has problematic behavior. It could be for the captain of your team who's a great leader, but who, who has trouble in different uh, circumstances or different situations based on their history. And, and that leads into a great next question when you mentioned history and the idea of labels, because I think when people do think about bullying, they also think about maybe a reputation people have before they even get to experience them. Athletes come together, maybe they were on different teams, they played against each other, and now they're going to join forces on the same team and everyone gets together and already has a feeling of, hey, person X or Y, you know, they're, they're known as a difficult person or they're a bully or whatever it might be. Why is it essential to avoid that sort of thing? Yeah, we hear that all the time, don't we? We And I'm sure as coaches, I hopefully there's lots of coaches on the call tonight. And I think that coaches talk and athletes do get labeled. They get labeled as a strong leader. They get labeled as, you know, a good team player. And they also get labeled with some negative labels, like sometimes they're prima donnas and then, then other times they're bullies. And those labels really stick with people. Um, but the thing about labels is that they don't really describe the attributes of the person. So it's a real shame um, if you have a young person who has some problematic behavior that hasn't been addressed or supported um, in creating some change in how they're, they're comporting themselves on the team to, to assign that label to them and, and have that label kind of stick with them throughout their career. Um, certainly I've seen it happen lots of times. Entire associations can talk about sort of a bully who's on a team and, and it's pretty tough to, to change that label once you have one. Um, the other thing about labels is it really oversimplifies problems that happen on teams or within associations. I think that it really creates a bit of a dichotomy of like there's a good guy and a bad guy or there's, you know, there's a bad apple and it's just the bad apple that's causing all of the problems. When conflict is so much more complex than that and I think likely Greg you've experienced that in, in, your, in your career and I think we all have had some experience with the complexities of conflict. And so just breaking it down into there being one problem person um, makes us think that, oh, if we just eliminate that person, then the problems will go away when we know that that's not actually the case. We're talking with Nadia Kaiba here, author and true sport expert from our friends over at True Sport. If you have a question, if you're watching on Facebook Live, we're talking all about bullying, feel free to leave it in the comments. We're gonna to continue to address some other topics within this topic. I thought it was important too, as you talked about labels as it relates to young athletes, so many of the people that play water polo in the US are in that 18 and under age range and people change, right? They grow. What, what someone was at 13 or 14 is so different when they're 17 or 18. That must play a huge part too and really not labeling someone so they have a chance to, to grow up and be something better and different. Absolutely. Like 
That, Greg, I love it that you just said that because my daughter several years back said that to me. She said something like, don't, don't judge a person by the worst thing that they've ever done. And I just thought, yeah, like I wouldn't like thinking about my past and some of the crummy things that I've done and that I know we've all done, you know, things that we're not proud of. I'd hate to be judged for the rest of my life based on that, despite all of the other great things that I've done. And so why would we want to do that to kids? Why would we want to be doing that to the kids that were there to support um, in their growth in, in such a positive thing as water polo or any sport? During the pandemic, one of the big things missing for athletes has been that structure that comes with a team. They're, of course, having their Zoom calls. Maybe they're able to get together. Now we're seeing more athletes able to get back in the water, but it is hit or miss around the country in the U.S. Some can play full water polo, others limited interaction in the water. And so the structure really is kind of not there from what they're used to. It's something you hear even the highest level athletes, right? Olympians, they, they love their schedule. They love knowing practices at nine, it ends at noon, we're going to do this, we have coffee before, that sort of thing. How does a, a good structure, how can a coach set the table with the important details for all the athletes that maybe will help limit some of that bullying behavior? Yeah, I love that point, Greg. I, we're seeing the exact same thing here in Canada. Like, these are these are athletes who have been raised on structure. They know they know their routine. They know when they're training before and after school. They know, you know, when it's competitive season. All of those things. And so I think that off that they're kind of feeling like fish. Another swimming analogy: fish out of water, right? Um, literally for you guys. <laughs> so you, you are, you're exactly right. Yes. <laughs> Um, and going back to your question about how does that impact bullying type behaviors and what can coaches do about that? I, the key to, to managing bullying type behaviors in any team dynamic is through transparency, through setting really clear boundaries right from the beginning of a season and setting clear firm guidelines so that it's not, so that we're not waiting for problems to happen, but we're anticipating problems happening and developing guidelines that share what the consequences of poor behavior are going to be, and then really enforcing it right as soon as you see it. So not kind of taking that stance of, oh, well, they're boys, they'll be boys, and you know, girls, there's always drama, like those sorts of, those sorts of attitudes aren't helpful. Um, what is helpful is for, for kids who have had perhaps unstable backgrounds, who haven't had a lot of boundaries or consistency and maybe they're they're getting that through sport um, and relying on that to give that to them so that they can feel supported so that they can take risks as athletes and as people and have that opportunity to shine rather than defaulting to the negative behaviors you hit on a good point athletes that maybe aren't aren't getting that sort of structure elsewhere in life is there I don't know, a feeling of belonging or safety that comes for kids like that when they have something in their life, maybe it's the conduct of their coach or their team that they can really count on? 100%. So in my background, the reason I got into this type of work is because in my background as a social worker, that's what I was seeing. I was seeing kids who were having a lot of trouble in their home lives, in school, and in weren't having an awful lot of success in those areas going into sport and being incredibly successful because they had that one adult that they could look up to. They had the support of a team who became their second family. And that's a heady responsibility for, for coaches and for associations, but it's, it's such an important part of the work that we do. Um, so creating a safe place where there is, is that clear structure, there are clear guidelines, where it's not sort of a moving scale on how the coach is feeling that day or how the association is, you know, distracted by something else where, where it's always um, predictable, that can, that can just really help out a lot with some of the, the kids that, that are wanting to get involved in the sports. We, we've talked about kind of the experience, and of course we're focusing on sports, but sports and school, especially at, at the age of 18 and under, just kind of really bleed together. You even see it at the college level as well. And in the classroom, you often hear teachers kind of do that, you know, feedback sandwich, if you will, right? Something positive, then we got to address kind of the concern, and then we finish on a high note positive. Let's, let's talk a bit about feedback, right, and kind of highlighting the positive. So even in athletes that maybe, and this maybe leads into kind of changing that reputation or label for an athlete, but 
for starters, why is it so important to recognize and highlight good behavior in athletes? Well, they, they thrive off of it. I think anyone who's coached has seen that, that they, they really thrive off of that and it gives them something to work from. Um, another concept that we, we use a lot in social work is called a strength-based approach where we, it's not that we don't talk about um, areas for improvement, but we always lead with strengths. Like, what are you doing well? And then they sort of buy in and they want to improve. They, want, they feel more a part of the team and they feel more supported by the adult who's leading the team. And so, you know, by giving, by using a strength-based approach, um, we, we give athletes that opportunity to, to sort of fill some of those gaps that they may have missed in other parts of their lives. Could be even be, um, if there is someone who's engaging in bullying type behaviors, they wanna feel leadership. Maybe they wanna feel belonging, acceptance, all of these things that they're not getting in other parts of their life and they're, they're going about it in the wrong way. So giving them opportunities to take those small steps um, uh, and changing their behaviors by using those strength-based uh, opportunities helps. And then when, when you have this firm structure that we were talking about, and it's a coach or a teacher, whoever the leader is, if they're the one giving out good feedback, even to those that have previously maybe had problems, how much does that kind of help bring, bring the group together and maybe help kind of coalesce the kids who have always had a good reputation with ones who are kind of building their way back? Well, I think that if you involve your team in developing guidelines of how you are going to be together, so whether or not you're that kid who's, who's really struggling, or if you're that kid who's, you know, finds it a little bit easier and is more successful in different areas of their life, um, setting those guidelines together and having, having the, the young athletes develop the guidelines um, for every different situation that the team is going to be in creates an atmosphere of accountability and it, it brings the team together and puts the team on the same page. So if, you, if you're a coach, if you bring your team together and say, hey, like what's important to us as a team when we're traveling? How, is, how are we going to assign hotel rooms? How are we going to um, carpool or, or assign plane seats or, or whatever it might be? Um, and then have so that kids aren't being left out, so that there aren't those opportunities where bullying type behaviors start to come up and clicks start to form and exclusion starts to happen. And, you know, and it's funny too, as you hit on that, I was just thinking about the traveling. I love that you mentioned that because people often think fissures develop in a team from all the on field or in pool activity. And it's so often not that. It's the thing away from the competition the, the uncertainty of the hotel room or who's sitting with who at dinner that, that allows these things to bubble up. Yeah, and if the coach can facilitate the conversation, but if the conversation can be led by the athletes so that they get, so that there's more buy-in, um, it can really help. So if a coach says, hey, I'm, I'm concerned about exclusion, I'm concerned about clicks, and I really want our team to gel, because if we gel, we're gonna perform well, we're gonna reach our goals, and we're all going to have a much better time. And, and these are the different scenarios where it's important for us to um, have these guidelines and create opportunities for us to gel and then pass it over to the team and, and get them to develop some, some ideas. Um, I think the more different scenarios that you can set guidelines for so that there isn't that uncertainty of what the expectations are, the better. So I've seen, I know that a lot of coaches, which I really respect, will have guidelines in terms of what their expectations are academically for their athletes. <clears throat> but you could also have guidelines for how are you gonna comport yourself at school? How are you going to show up for your teachers, for your principal, for your athletic director when you're, not, when you're away from the team? Because that's part of being on our team and that's how we're gonna carry ourselves. And I think all those little things contribute to um, to people who maybe are, are gonna lean towards the negative behaviors to buy in. Really good stuff here, talking about bullying and there's really so much involved with that. It's such a broad topic and there's so many parts to it to really handle it effectively. Getting into a bit, the role teammates can play and from sports movies are great stories. I think people think about the, the teammate that has a big impact is maybe the rah-rah captain who gives the great speech or you know, someone who kind of breaks up a fight, but not, not everyone wants to play that role, right? They want to be on the team and 
they, they want to be a good teammate, but they're not maybe particularly vocal or it's not their personality to try and stop something larger like bullying, but they want to be helpful. How do you kind of get everyone to, to feel like they can contribute if maybe it isn't their personality to be, to be more vocal or to be more assertive in kind of confronting some of these issues? Um, it's so interesting that you bring that up because one of the things that I talk about in my book is the importance of leadership and peer leadership and how it's not what we always think it is. So it's not always that person that you're talking about who's raw, raw. Um, with the athletes that I interviewed for my book, as well as in the workshops that I've done, what I've noticed is when I do like a leadership workshop, associations will send, send kids in and they're not all that rah, rah, like super outspoken. A lot of them have played different roles in leadership. So some of them will stay behind and help me to clean up or some of them will come early and help me to set up. So they all have these little attributes that, that make a great leader, but it's not always that sort of stereotypical you know, person at the top of the podium who's very vocal. And I think um, what coaches and teams and associations can do is, is identify those leaders and really talk about how, how their leadership matters, how they um, can progress into being an even stronger leader and support them in doing that with a with leadership plan. But also the, the kids who are not necessarily um, showing some of those leadership um, uh, traits how can they become better leaders? Because it doesn't matter who you are, anyone can, can be a leader. I think, it, is it Nelson Mandela who has that great quote about leading from behind? That sounds familiar, but I'd have to double check online to make sure. Yeah, but even being a strong role model for someone who's younger, that's a leadership trait. So it doesn't necessarily have to be on that team that you're on, but everybody wants to feel valued and everyone wants to feel like they have a role on a team. And so as a coach and as, as team members trying to find that value and role for everyone on the team. You've hit on a lot of the things that people can do once they know there's a problem or to kind of prevent some of that, right? It's a bit of a proactive approach. We talk about everyone kind of feeling that, that value, right? And I think that's a different thing too. There's a lot of talk lately about um, kind of everyone wanting, especially in youth sports, this idea of everyone gets a trophy, right? And everyone gets, gets acknowledgement, right? I think it's important people know that's in a different bucket, right? This is like just building a good team and making sure that everyone feels valued, not necessarily that they're told they're the best and they're number one, right? But more about just everyone feeling a part of the team. Yeah, exactly. People, people join sports for all different reasons. Not everyone is there because they, you know, they're going to be going to the Olympics. There's people who are there for, because they want to have those social relationships. They may be there, like I mentioned earlier, because that's, that's like one of the, the only places where they're feeling acceptance. Maybe they don't feel that from their home or from their school. And um, if, if they can feel like they have a role, regardless of why they're there, then it's, it will help them buy into to the team and it will make the team stronger. From there, let's talk about how you identify some of this. So we've hit on a lot of the strategies, as we were saying, to kind of prevent it or maybe help correct it when it's in play. And, Oftentimes, if a team is successful, right, they often say, you know, winning can forgive a lot of sins, right? You don't really maybe recognize there are problems if the team is performing well, but what are things coaches and teammates, fellow athletes, maybe parents should be looking for, uh, you know, that overt bullying, I'm sure is very obvious, but maybe some of that under the surface stuff that isn't as clear. What coaches can do um, is right from the beginning of the season, be watching for clues. So when they see, especially nonverbal clues, and you guys know, right, coaches, you guys know when, when you see when people are rolling their eyes or when people are being excluded. And sometimes it doesn't seem all that serious, but if you've set those team guidelines from the beginning and people are, are behaving in that way, um, you, you gotta bring it up and you gotta address it right from the beginning. One of the mistakes that I've done when I've been doing mediation is, you know, at first, you start, conflict's uncomfortable, so we tiptoe around it, right? So you'll see someone roll their eyes or whisper something, and you don't want to address it because you want to keep working on what your goal is. So you want to keep training or working towards whatever it is that you're working towards. But every time you ignore it, it's, it makes you complicit in it, and it gives that person permission to keep doing it. So it's, it's just so crucial that 
right from the beginning of the season, you're setting that tone and you're being really transparent about why you're doing it for the, for the good of the entire team. And because your team likely will have goals that you're working towards. And every time you have an athlete who's, who's undermining those goals, it's setting the whole team back and it's a distraction. Early on, you talked about the role that social media can play, photos, that sort of thing. And I'm sure that has only added a, a massive curveball to tackling all of this. But how can a coach or someone in charge kind of step in and identify something that maybe they can't really even see on the surface? It's not happening out in the open. It's, you know, it's happening in the context of a phone or on a laptop and that sort of thing. Yeah, you make such a good point there, Greg. Um, absolutely. Like coaches aren't on Snapchat with their, with their athletes, I wouldn't think. Right. Um, some of the things that coaches can do is they can right at the beginning of the season, have a conversation with their team about conflict and problems and talk about how any great team will go through conflict. And if they can successfully navigate it without it distracting them, then they are so much more likely to reach their goals. But there's so many teams who get sidetracked by conflict and they just don't reach their full potential. So if a coach says to the team, we're going to go through conflict and it's, if we address it, if we use skill, concrete communication skills, and hopefully he'll, he'll train them in some of those, um, we'll get through it. And I'm going to give you these forums where we can talk about problems that are coming up as they come up in a safe place using this, this normalization um, of conflict belief that I have, then that, that can really help. And hopefully in those, in those meetings, people can talk about maybe what they've seen on social media or they can at least know that they're having to be accountable to their teammates who have seen what they've seen on social media. Well, Nadia, we have covered a lot of stuff, really, really good informative details from you. What else should people know? What else, if anything, are we, are we kind of missing as far as this topic is concerned? Um, it's, been, I, it's been so interesting in the last few years working with athletes and working even with um, association and send coaches. I feel like people have really gotten away from having face-to-face -face conversations. I mean, other than like during COVID and of yeah. course, none of us are. <laughs> But you yeah. and I are right now, Greg, like I feel yeah. like we're having, we have a connection and we're talking and this Perfect. wasn't so complicated. No. Um, but what's happening is people are texting, they're emailing and they're, they're really getting away from those face-to-face -face conversations. So I think if, if you can open um, those opportunities as a coach for your players and yourself to sit down together and have face-to-face -face conversations, make it predictable, make it once a week at a certain time, um, and not leaving people to have to try and sort out their conversations online through social media by text and then train them on on things that you can say to have a tricky conversation like what you said really hurt my feelings and this is how I'm feeling and you know all of that will go a long way so that's that's really what I want people to leave with is is trying to implement some of those tools on their teams you you mentioned a great point because as as wonderful as technology is it is made things so easy. I mean, now you send an email and there's suggestive text on what the reply should be back to remove all thought about what you might say to even your, your best friend or a teammate. And to your, to your point, especially once we're past the pandemic situation, uh, hopefully if there's one silver lining of all this is that people might be craving that face-to-face -face interaction they haven't been getting. I hope so. I mean, I think I think conflict is scary and I think people get nervous when problems come up and it's tough to have tricky conversations. It's tough to talk about something when, they're, when you're upset about it. Um, but I, yeah, I, I just, I have pretty much never seen a conflict being resolved by email or by text, <laughs> right? So I'm really hoping that this, the pandemic is leading people to be able to, to do that a little bit more, crave it like you're saying. Nadia, before we close, tell us a bit about your book. We mentioned the title at the top. This is how we roll a coach's guide to transforming conflict into high performance. First, where, where can people get it? And, and what else is in there that maybe we didn't cover? Or is it a larger summary of what we went into? Just give us a little bit of a look inside that. Yeah, so it's a book. It came out uh, in November, which seems like 100 million years ago now <laughs> since COVID. It's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. It's available online. Um, and it's about, it's a guide for coaches using social work tools and principles on how to develop a really strong, positive team culture 
with specific strategies that they can train their team in um, for, for how the team runs, but also skill building. So scripts on how to have tricky conversations, how to anticipate conflict coming up. When does it typically come up? How can you address it when it does come up? And then how do you set up those systems, like I'm saying, to prevent it from coming, coming back and from distracting your team? Good stuff. Uh, so available there, as she mentioned, on Amazon and online. Nadia Kaiba from True Support, also author and expert. Thanks so much for spending some time with us here today. Thank you so much for having me. I hope everyone stays well, and I hope you're back in the pool real soon. Thanks so much. And uh, coaches, spread the word on this. I think a great talk. Uh, everything Nadia talked about on bullying, worth sharing with your staff and with your teams. We'll have more at home with USA Water Polo later this week and next week. So make sure you check the USA Water Polo email for more.